hope you can all see that now. Yeah, that's perfect. We can see and hear you clearly. Very good. Well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, and I appreciate to the organizers the opportunity to share a little bit of my story in AI and let's say a few suggestions I would have around anybody on the call here getting started as well as a, some of the interesting projects I've had the opportunity to be working on or have worked on in the past. So a, my name is Jonathan Armstrong. Um, I'm a machine learning engineer at Serdan. They're a medical imaging and data analytics pathology company in Lisbon. I'm currently doing a computer science PhD with Queen's University Belfast a, on deep learning for digital pathology. And I have a mechanical engineering degree from a federal university in South Brazil. So that last comment might have given you a small hint, but I just wanted to ask the question or wondered if anybody could tell me the link between these two images. So this is a coal fired power plant in the north of Brazil, and also a picture of a breast mammogram. And really, the very interesting link between that is artificial intelligence and then also me. So I started out my journey really, a, my parents are missionaries in Brazil, and I started out a, and I did mechanical engineering, a degree in mechanical engineering. And it really stemmed from a conversation I had with a friend of the family who's a surgeon in England, a, really because I was very interested in getting into biomedical engineering, but I didn't have that exact course to do. And he said, well, do mechanical engineering because you'll get a lot of experience and a broad spectrum of, of, of study, and then you can decide where you're going later. So it's very interesting to now have come full circle and now not actually be in the mechanical side of biomedical engineering, but really the software side and the analytics and AI side of biomedical engineering. So by the end of my dissertation, I ended up joining, uh, by the end of my degree, I ended up joining a lab, a thermal, thermal lab in the university. And they were working on a two year project around a coal fired power plant. And our goal was to model that power plant in various different ways, maybe looking at the thermal analysis, the flow analysis of it, but then also AI was one of the ways we were going to look at it. And so we applied AI to, to look at the input of coal, the humidity, the dampness of the coal, the amount of ash, strange things, but then looking at the output of a electricity at the other end. And so that experience in AI with the data and with the results then it meant I could, was able to apply for a job that appeared in the KTP program with Queens in AI and medical imaging at CERDAN. So the KTP stands for Knowledge Transfer Partnership. That is transferring knowledge from a private comp for, from a university into a private company that is key to the company's development. And then also along with CERDAN, I started a PhD in deep learning for digital pathology. So you might be maybe sitting on this call and I saw an interesting poll there. Quite a few of you are just interested in knowing where to start really with AI. I know some people will already, this is old hat, but where to start? Well, a lot of times you could maybe just do like I did, look at it for your dissertation. I did a dissertation, I did a degree in mechanical engineering. So, you know, if you're working with audio, you're working with medical side of things, computer science, engineering, anything that is very much data driven can be analyzed with AI. And as long as you know how to apply the tools right and do some research into that, that could be a very interesting way of starting. There's also the KTP project. There's an awful lot of, AI. I think Queens has around 50 KTP projects ongoing at the minute. And speaking to one of my advisors recently, he said that around 60% of the KTP projects already involve AI somewhat in those projects. PhD or further studies are another interesting way of getting into this area. But the reality is everybody can start at home. You can start where you are by just looking at some helpful resources. And that's where I got an awful lot of my initial learning in machine learning and AI. And I just wanted to list a few helpful resources that I find. For example, Microsoft AI School, they have a lot of very interesting, good free courses. Anybody can do. If you want a certificate, you can pay for it but the course in itself is free. Kaggle, for example, Kaggle is a, is a site 
that they offer an awful lot of open data sets and challenges that people can then use this data to apply their AI skills, follow what somebody else has done and learn that way. There's some very good YouTube tutorials that I found as well, or you could do Udemy courses, find some paid courses. But I have here just a list of courses and things that really helped me to get started. And I'm very happy to share this by email with the, with the organizers later that they can share to the rest of you then if there's, there's any interest. But uh, feel free to reach out to me on that as well. And the reality is, what I say to you is, you know, don't be afraid to get involved. But just be aware that machine learning is a tool. And in order to use a tool, you need to know intrinsically how the tool works. And it's knowledge of how the tool works and knowledge of the data that you're applying that tool to that is crucial for you to get a good project. And so just a little word of caution, and I think this is exemplified by the Gartner High Curve. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that, but it's a curve that looks at emerging technologies. It looks at them along different, the bottom axis really looks at sort of the human feeling on it. And your danger is when you're in this area here, the peak of inflated expectations, because that's where everybody thinks that this is the bee's knees. It's going to do everything. It's going to solve all our problems. And in 2018, deep learning and neural networks was right at the very top of that. Now, it's more interesting to look at the 2020 Gartner Hype Curve. It sort of expanded a bit. There's now six AI machine learning related subjects. People have seemed to get a better grasp of what's really happening. But also, you know, explainable AI, being able to understand what the black box is saying, that's still something that's very much at the peak of, expected, uh, of inflated expectations. And to me, it's important to stay grounded in your data, grounded in your knowledge of how you're applying that, so that when you come to the trough of disillusionment, when you come to that point where people say, well, it's maybe not all it's meant to be, you know that. You've already passed that peak of inflated expectations and know how to apply this tool really well. So I thought it would be interesting as well to just cover a wee bit for people who maybe aren't familiar with AI really at all. So how does it actually work? You know, what's happening on a very basic level with a basic example, what, how do the machines learn? And that's why I don't like calling it artificial intelligence. It sounds like something scary in sci-fi. The reality is it's machine learning. It's a statistical model of a certain amount of information. That's the way it works. But let's take an example. For example, your times tables. You started out with a problem, five times five, and a result, 25. And you move down, and it's through repetition that you actually started to learn your times tables. You tested your knowledge by maybe a parent or a teacher asking you the times tables, and then, with the principles you'd learned from your times tables, you could go out and say, well, I hadn't learned up to you know, five times 11, but you know it's 55. That's really the way it works with an algorithm. You need data, you need a, a problem and a result. Whether that's an image, a little image, and it says cancer, not cancer, whether that is input data and an output of electricity like the power plant, but through repetition, the algorithms will learn and they'll check against themselves with testing their knowledge. It's called validation. So you've got your training, it learns, your validation, it's testing. And then finally, things it hasn't seen before is your final testing to make sure you've got a really robust algorithm. So normally you start out with your data. In any algorithm, you'll start out with data. The common thing to do is divide it into two or three parts, normally training, and validation and maybe an extra 10% for that testing I mentioned. But based on your training, you train your algorithm, you check it against the validation, and then it's upon the comparison of these validation accuracy and your algorithm accuracy. If they're both close together, it means that your algorithm is, yes, learning with the data it's been given, learning with the things it hasn't actually seen that much yet, and it means you've got a good robust algorithm. If that's not the case, if you've got a high accuracy but a low validation accuracy, it means it's really just learnt the images off. It knows the thing off by heart, but it hasn't really understood the underlying information in that. So in other words, it's just learnt the timetable off by heart, but it hasn't really understood them. And now the times table is a bit of a funny example because obviously AI isn't to be used for times tables. That goes back to my previous comment that you need to know your data 
and the tool and how to apply it. You need to be aware that sometimes there's a far simpler way of getting sound information out of the data, not just through AI. And it all boils down to the simple comment and to quote, you know, Bill Clinton, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it's all in the data, stupid. Everything is data dependent. The problem is always in the data. Well, you know, virtually always, the odd time you have a bug in your code or an error in the Python environment, that's beside the point. It's, it's through your data and understanding your data. And if you've got biased data to, for example, years ago, Amazon used it to decide the initial decision on the CVs that they were for new applicants. But they had a really bad algorithm that only, only suggested male CVs, only employed men because they had trained it on historic data. Historically, they had employed more men than women. So the algorithm just made that decision for them. And that's where you need to be aware of your data to then apply this tool. So I thought it'd be interesting just then to cover a few of the current projects that I'm working on in Serdan. And they really all center around a very specific area, which is the screening programs that are ongoing in the UK, which are medical programs that are to catch the early forms of cancer. There's a bile cancer screening program, which involves a colonoscopy and whole slide images from digital pathology. Or there's the breast cancer screening program, which involves mammographies or mammograms. So those are more x-ray style of images. So I've been working on three different projects, really mainly starting out with the mammograms, starting to be able to identify anomalies using AI, identifying anomalies in mammograms, then really focusing, applying that learning to Serdan's own problem. We have a little x-ray cabinet where we look at a biopsies that come out of these mammogram tests and we look at them in an x-ray form and I'll show you a few images, explain it a bit better later. And then finally looking at the outcome of the bile cancer screening program, these colon polyps. So those are the three areas, they're all image driven, but we plan to focus more on data analytics as well in the future. And the main motivation behind this is that in spite of all of these screening programs, they're excellent, but the difficulty is that they put a massive additional pressure on clinicians. And so only one in five UK trusts in radiology have enough radiologists to run a safe 24 seven service. And that cost the NHS a couple of years ago, actually now, it cost them 165 million in outsourcing to places even like Australia, sending those images, those mammograms, those x-rays to Australia to get them diagnosed overnight to come back to you here. Pathology, same story, only even less. There's only 3% of UK pathology labs have enough staff to make the clinical demand. And that costs around 25 million, 27 million a year across the UK. So that gives you an idea of the need. And it's not as even as if that need can be supplied really quickly because it takes you maybe 10 years, 15 years to train up a pathologist or a radiologist. So some drastic change needs to happen in the meantime. And that's where I've really appreciated being part of Serdan, starting to look into those different areas, to those clinical pathways, to those workflows, to try and really make a difference. And our goal is to improve well-being through innovation. Serdan works in various different areas. One is limbs, not, not human limbs, but laboratory information management systems. So the software that controls labs, also in medical imaging then, in x-rays, and digital pathology slides. And so we're focusing on pathology analytics and that's why that's been really the main driver behind any projects I've done so far. And the initial start then has been around these mammograms. And I just wanted to sort of show you, exemplify a little bit of how a pro what a project sort of looks like. Once you have your data, when you have your results, these mammograms all, here's a few pictures of the mammograms from an open data set. These mammograms all came with a certain amount of background information. So what clinicians had identified as an anomalous region, a cancerous area? Those images then, as you see here on the right, and I've just put a little red circle to exemplify that is an anomalous, a cancerous region. Then they're transformed into a more algorithm readable way. So those are small patches. And we divide them into small patches. And so basically any patch that isn't within this red circle is defined as a negative patch, has no cancer. 
any patch that was in the red circle is a positive patch. And so you've now, you're now back to where we discussed at the start. You've got your data and you've got your result. You've got your problem, cancer, not cancer. And the result, this is a cancerous patch. This isn't a cancerous patch. And so training the algorithm on that, then I was able to develop an algorithm that identified going through a mammogram, was able to by itself in 15 seconds, start putting on these outputs, as you can see here. And this it correctly diagnosed an, an anomalous patch. And so from an open data set, you can start to extract really interesting information and then apply this finally to the needle biopsy images from our own private data set. And this algorithm here was trained to identify little precursor signs of cancer, which are little calcifications. You can see these little black dots. And so you can very well add information into the clinical pathway, add information onto what the clinician is seeing to help them make a more informed decision. And it's really the same then going into the colon polyps. Colon polyps are skin tags that develop. The earlier you catch them, the better. Based on what the skin tags look like, let's say, then you decide the person's further treatment. And here's like just a little progression of how the, the colon a polyps progress. It's a little skin tag that then can become cancerous and dangerous. But what does the clinician look at? Well, they do a colonoscopy. They extract those little patches, those little, sorry, polyps. Those polyps are then turned into whole slide images. So as you can see here, here's basically a cross section of one of these little polyps. And you can see there's an, you can see this darker region here with a sort of funnily, more motley growth. Those are anomalous regions. Those are cancerous regions. And based on the diagnosis of those regions is what you decide the person's clinical pathway, whether they come back every year for a checkup or every five years for a checkup, or they don't need another checkup. And so the clinician really in this case they want to identify what the polyp is, give it a classification, how serious it is, maybe look at the area, but output that to a report. And so it's crucial to speak to the clinicians or the people who know the data and see what they want out of the data, what they normally, what their pathway is. So they get the images and turn it into what? A report. And so Based on that, then, we have uh, collected with the Royal Victoria Hospital 500 fully annotated slides, working with uh, Dr. Morris Lochery in the Royal as part of a project to get these slides annotated to then create this boundary, as you can see here. And based on this boundary, then you start to train your algorithm. But no longer are you using positive and negative patches, like I showed before, but now with this mask here, you can start training the algorithm on an input image and an output image. And so at the end of this, with lots of training, you could start to get the, the algorithm to output basically this exact picture here based on a normal slide image. So really the key takeaways I would like to just share with the folks here today is there's nothing really to stop you starting now in AI. There's an awful lot of open data sets and an awful lot of open opportunities all around. With a bit of experience, you'll be able to use or apply for jobs or use it for other things. The key in all of it is the data. You need to know where your data is coming from and know your data intrinsically to then be able to apply the tool. You need to also listen to the people from whom you got the data or study the data and understand what they actually want, what decisions they want to make coming from that data. And the goal, the overarching goal in my projects and for CERDAN is to maximize the use of clinical time so that they don't need to see all of those normal bits of information. So they don't need to have their work lists packed up with too much information. They can mainly, mainly use their time on things that matter and you enrich the whole decision-making process and even may make different studies and analysis that people haven't actually seen before. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope that wasn't too fast, but I hope that gave you a bit of an insight to how AI has been applied in the medical sphere, at least, and a wee bit of my pathway in it. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That talk was very insightful and interesting. Um, 
well, what we'd like to say is we're happy enough to open the floor to the attendees. If you want to ask any questions, you can pop them in the chat or um, alternatively, you can um, unmute your mic. Jonathan, it's Philip Patterson here. Is it very interesting what you're doing and it's very insightful to what you're going through and very important. The training part of it, how do you go about that? Is, it, is that built up with inside the tool? around the training or which way does that work? The training part is normally use, I use a, a, a language called TensorFlow. So it's a way it builds out a network. So you define your shape of the network. Normally you use networks that have already been used in the past. That sort of thing that have an awful lot of research behind them. Mm -hmm. And those networks really, their sole goal is to look at an image or look at data and compress that down and nearly linearize it into decisions and it'll apply little filters right across for example an image and start picking out features let's say that make that decision process but you run through hundreds of thousands of images each time and do maybe a hundred iterations over your model until you get a good high enough accuracy and that's really where your training comes from okay i'm really I don't know if that answers your question the images that you're putting in, do you know the, the outputs of the... Yes. They are, it's, so it's, then, you're, then that, your training is then you're validating against the images that you have put through. Is that the way you would do it? Well, normally you keep those images separate that you're validating against, but yes. you, you Okay. But what I've been doing is supervised learning, which means you need to know the input and the output. So you show yeah. it an input and an output, iterate over that, and then it's be able to make decisions on images it hasn't really seen yet. Okay, Grant. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, quick, quick one Hi. for me. Um, you went from mechanical engineering to what is now really AI engineering. How on earth did you make that jump? Well, I, I've always been fascinated by AI, always sounded interesting. And I was doing my dissertation just at the, the very peak of that hype curve that I showed at the start. So it was very interesting. And to be able to apply that to model a power plant was a very interesting option. And to then find a job in that sphere really was just the next goal. Or I, I'd been thinking of either a job or then doing maybe a master in data analytics and machine learning, that sort of thing. It was more that jump of using it as a tool, being a specialist somewhat in an area, using it as an additional tool, and then we really fell in love with the tool and moved on from there. Fair play, congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your question. If it's okay, I have a wee question for you, Jonathan. Um, Absolutely. I was wondering, with your collaboration with the ho local hospital here, uh, do the patients volunteer their data or what sort of way does that work? Um, so that's something that we have to be very careful with. It's We needed to get full ethical approval from the Northern Ireland Biobank to be able to then use these images and scan them. Granted, the in the screening program, in the bottle cancer screening program, part of the... the patient signs up to, uh, to be part of the bile cancer screening program to get this screening is that their data or their, their images might be used for clinical research in the future. It's totally anonymized. We haven't a clue of that, what's happened in behind those images, but we do have that diagnosis from a specialist for each one of those images. I was wondering how the ethics of that would work. That's that's really interesting. I, I have one more question just with your um, personal experience in your daily job. What sort of technologies and languages would you use specifically to analyze these images? Really Python. And so I, I ended up learning Python for AI machine learning and progressing into some of the me and deep learning machine learning libraries. So that's a TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, those are the main libraries around deep learning. Um, and 
you know, they're, they're very much geared to this exact problem and, and everybody uses either TensorFlow or PyTorch. I'm in the PyTorch side, on the TensorFlow side, sorry, but they're both pretty similar, I believe. Oh, that's brilliant. Even those keywords are worth sharing for people to look up. I haven't heard of PyTorch myself, so that's something. To it's another learn equivalent about. language, yes, to Keras, to, to TensorFlow, sorry. And Keras really is a is a more high level language, but then can have, you know, a Keras form of TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is your more granular way. And that's really why you end up doing research in it is to sort of get those little small amounts percentage improvements. Yes, you could apply an online tool. But the reality is to really get a good understanding and a sound our algorithm, you need to be applying it from start to finish and understand the process. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Does anyone else have questions for Jonathan? Doesn't seem it. I just double checked the chat there to be sure that nobody had typed anything. Um, that's brilliant. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was really insightful okay. and informative. Thank you very much then. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker coming up is Fiona and Fiona is the head of AI at The Tactics. And hopefully she'll be able to share her screen. Hello, everyone. Just going to check if you can see my screen. OK. Yeah, that's perfect. We can hear you yes. too. Oh, super. That's even better. Um, so hello and um, thank you very much for inviting me here this afternoon or this evening uh, to, to talk about um, how to get started in, in machine learning. Um, I caught the, the end of Jonathan's talk there, which was really, really interesting, especially the, the work um, along TensorFlow and, and so on. Um, so hopefully I'm not repeating what um, Jonathan has, has, has said. Um, I'm going to focus a bit more on the, the data side um, in, in this talk. So, um, so yes, so I currently head up uh, machine learning at um, Detactics, and uh, my background um, is in computer science. So that's my my primary uh, degree. And before Detactics, um, I had a background both in academia and in industry as as well. So previous to Detactics, uh, I worked as a lecturer in computer science at um, Ulster University. So I may I may have taught um, a few of you on on this call here this evening. So um, apologies in, in advance um, for that. Uh, so I taught the data analytics um, course for final years in computer science and, and software uh, engineering. And uh, my research uh, is in applied machine learning, um, primarily in the bioinformatics domain. Uh, so I have a PhD in um, computing science uh, with applied AI in, in bioinformatics. Uh, and that's from Ulster University. And that was way back in 2009 that um, I, I graduated. And what we were doing at that uh, stage was um, using machine learning to make um, predictions on uh, genomic uh, data. So it was all about data integration and um, prediction using machine learning models. And interestingly, whenever I graduated um, from the PhD, there was no such role as machine learning or AI within industry at that time. So it really shows how things have, have moved on and, and, and progressed. Um, in industry, I've held roles as web developers and um, a senior software developer at uh, Path Excel as well. So a real mix of, um, of academia and, and industry. So if I kick off here. 
about a year and a half, two years ago, we set up um, a machine learning team within Detactics. So I'm not sure if anybody knows um, Detactics, who we are or, or, or what we do. Uh, our offices are located uh, just beside the Waterfront Hall in, in, in Belfast. And we've also got offices in Milan, London, and New York uh, as, as well. And we specialize in data quality and matching at scale. And we work in areas such as the financial sector and uh, the governmental sector as, as well. So we started up the machine learning group uh, at Detactics primarily to address um, manual tasks within the, the data quality uh, pipeline to see can we automate, uh, speed up and improve those um, manual areas. So we've looked at areas such as matching, uh, which I'm going to highlight in a bit more detail uh, tonight, and um, error detection, predicting data quality rules, um, generating data sets to feed into machine learning models and uh, labeling those data sets as well. And we're currently looking at uh, knowledge graphs, both in constructing knowledge graphs and analyzing the, the graphs. So we've got a team of uh, five um, currently working in the machine learning group. And um, there is a breadth of um, specialities within that team so we're we're multidisciplinary which uh, is required uh, to um, to build and um, support machine learning models in a production environment so we've got um, specialities in the teams which focus on um, the data engineering side we've got um, the devops um, capabilities within the team to help us um, deploy our models into production and to, to monitor them once they're in production uh, we've got uh, machine learning capabilities uh, within the team um, for building the models and also software development capabilities as well. So taking all that good practice from software engineering uh, in terms of um, versioning your data. Um, machine learning is very interesting because it's a bit more complex. It's, it's a living system, it's cyclic. So um, we also need to um, keep an eye on versions of data sets that we're using, the models that we are, are using, um, record experiments that um, we uh, develop and so on. So all of this um, needs to be taken into consideration whenever you are developing uh, models for a production and environment. Okay, so uh, the big meaty question, and I'm sure Jonathan uh, answered this very well in the, in the previous um, talk. So what is um, artificial intelligence and um, machine learning? Well, there isn't really an agreed upon um, term for uh, what AI uh, is. So um, my interpretation of it uh, at a very high level is that um, artificial intelligence is the capability of a computer to perform um, cognitive tasks such as speech recognition, language translation, um, vision, and so on, which uh, are, are usually performed by a, a human. And machine learning is a, a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, so these are the algorithms, the statistical models. So you may have heard of algorithms such as um, neural networks, random forest, k nearest neighbor, um, clustering algorithms, and so on. And uh, these learn from data. So we provide um, examples of um, what we intend to predict. And the models then learn patterns within this um, data uh, in order to distinguish between um, outcomes. So what we're trying to um, predict. 
And then there's different flavors of machine learning. So you've got supervised um, machine learning. And uh, I know Jonathan talked about this earlier. So supervised machine learning is where um, you label a data set and your model learns from that labeled um, data set. Um, unsupervised learning uh, is where your model learns from unlabeled training data. So it's trying to identify um, clusters or, or, or patterns or so on in, in, in the data. And then reinforcement um, learning is where a model continually learns and updates as, as, as it performs um, a task. So that is an incredibly <laughs> quick overview of um, AI and, and ML. Uh, if I was teaching this back at the university, I would usually maybe drag this out over a two hour lecture or, or so. So I'll spare you that um, this evening. Uh, so again, um, AI sort of an umbrella term and um, underneath that you have different disciplines such as your machine learning, natural language processing, um, speech recognition, um, computer vision, robotics, and, and so on. And there are lots and lots of algorithms uh, available as, as well. So um, I believe we've heard a bit about neural networks uh, from TensorFlow in, in, in the previous talk. Um, so we've got deep learning, ensemble methods, um, Bayesian decision trees, uh, a tremendous amount of machine learning algorithms that are out there. Um, and these have mainly come from academia and uh, are, are now being used uh, within an industrial um, context. And what's really interesting about this is that you've got a lot of breadth and scope in terms of machine learning models that, 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 that you can use. Um, there's no one model that outperforms them all. They each have their pros and their, their, their cons. And it's really your um, business problem or what you're trying to do, what you're trying to predict and the data that you have will dictate um, the, the best machine learning algorithm to, to address your, your problem. Um, and the good news is, is that we have lots of um, open source uh, and um, proprietary um, data out there, uh, supporting technologies out there um, to, to, to help us in our, our machine learning um, journey. So um, I think we, Kathleen had asked about languages and so on. So um, R and Python are some of the key languages um, within the machine learning community and um, there are lots of um, initiatives as well there to to, to support that um, so you're not you're not starting from um, scratch and in fact um, things like Amazon SageMaker and um, Azure machine learning um, have really leveled um, the, the barrier to um, using and um, implementing machine learning. So a lot of these um, complexities are hidden um, behind interfaces. So for example, in uh, Microsoft Azure, you know, there's a simple drag and, and drop um, capability to, to build up your machine learning um, project. So a lot of that complexity is actually abstracted. So that's really good whenever you're, you're, you're learning about, about this, this area. So I want to start off with what you initially think about whenever somebody says machine, machine learning. And um, often people get terribly excited about the applications of machine learning. Um, so, for example, oh, I'm going to, to build um, a, a classifier that's um, going to uh, beat the champions of AlphaGo. Or uh, I'm going to um, build a, a self-driving car. Um, maybe uh, a natural language processing system. So this is an example of um, 
uh, somebody calling a, a restaurant um, to to make a, a, a booking um, and it's all automated through machine learning um, to natural language processing. And we hear tremendous amount uh, about things like deep learning neural networks and um, TensorFlow and XGBoost, which is like uh, a deep um, a random random forest. And there's a lot of focus on, on this aspect um, of machine learning. And uh, I think what I'd like to, to highlight is to maybe set expectations of what um, a, a real life machine learning project actually um, looks like. So these are very simplified um, steps um, in, 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 in a life cycle of, of machine learning. And the vast amount of your time is going to be spent in step one and in step two here. So firstly, in defining um, your problem. So that could be your business problem, your prediction problem, what are you gonna do? Then obtaining the data um, for your machine learning model. A tremendous amount of time is going to be in cleaning, um, deduplicating, um, prepping your model, um, fitting it into a particular shape uh, that it can be ingested by a machine learning model, um, dividing your um, data set into training data, testing data, validation data sets. Um, this is where the bulk of the work um, actually um, resides in uh, before you even hit training models, um, testing models, evaluating your models um, and, and, and improving your, your, your models. So this is a little bit of um, expectation setting here. And these steps are hugely important uh, as, as, as well. So just to really highlight this point, um, all the different data pre-processing activities that can be um, performed. So taking a look at your data, um, maybe uh, dropping um, data from, from your data set um, that, 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 that either you don't need or um, it uh, wouldn't be good for the prediction process. Um, maybe uh, looking at uh, is there missing values in the data. Um, some models don't like missing values. So you either have to fill in those missing values um, or remove them completely from, 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 from your data set. Um, cleansing your data, uh, then maybe transforming um, your, your data into uh, a certain aspect so it can be um, ingested by your machine learning model. Um, selecting your features for your model and then also labeling your data set um, as, as, as well. So all highly important um, aspects of the, the, the whole process here. So this just uh, slide just shows um, different um, different analyses here. So this is an example of um, a correlation matrix. So saying um, if your features here are highly correlated to one another or, or not, um, and heat maps and so on. So a lot of time spent um, at, at this stage here, the pre-processing and um, getting your data set into, um, into shape. Now, um, if you don't believe me, uh, there's been a very recent um, paper by uh, Google Research, so 2021 here, and um, it's, it, sums it, it sums it up really well, is that everybody wants to do the, the model work in machine learning, but not the, the data work. And essentially, the takeaways from this paper is that um, Machine learning models are, are being applied in high stake domains such as health, finance, conservation, and the data quality is so important um, 
within the machine learning um, life cycle due to its its impact downstream. So due to it impacting predictions such as um, detecting cancer, um, defining whether or not somebody gets a loan um, to wildlife poaching. And very interestingly, um, data is the most undervalued and deglamorized aspect of AI. So um, I think if there's only one takeaway um, tonight is, uh, is, is, is the focus uh, whenever you are performing machine learning is the focus on um, your, your data quality, data pre-processing side. So that's my little um, rant over about um, data quality and how important it is. So um, where, 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 where's a good place um, to, to start um, with machine learning? So there are lots of um, resources um, out there. There's a really nice one from um, Google AI Education and um, it's, it's a really nice place um, to start if you're um, either completely new to machine learning um, or completely new even to um, computer science uh, as, as, as well. So it's, it's a good place um, to, to start. Um, if I'm back to my teaching hat on, um, pick a book, a book. Um, on machine learning. Um, Katie Nuggets here has uh, a nice list of their 10 best machine learning um, textbooks. And two of those um, that I would highlight is um, sort of the original elements of statistical learning, which gives a really good overview of um, the, the statistics and mathematics that underpin um, models. Uh, and then there's a the recent book, um, the hundred page, the hundred page machine learning book, um, and it's it's a really succinct book to um, get you started on your 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 machine learning um, journey. There's lots of open data sets um, available out there. So uh, you may, I'm sure you've heard of um, Kaggle before. So Kaggle has lots of open data sets and it also has competitions as, as well. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to go in and look at these competitions and the solutions uh, that, that people have um, provided to uh, prediction um, problems. And um, I always find mediums a really nice place to go as, as, as well whenever you're uh, at the start of your, your, your journey in, in, in learning uh, about, about machine learning or maybe a particular aspect um, of, of machine learning. So I'm going to pop out now and um, go through a, a worked example. So just to give a bit of context on um, this, why, why I wanted to show this particular example. Firstly, it's um, Colab. So Colab's quite nice. It's um, Google based and uh, it's like a Juniper notebook. Um, interface where you can go and um, run uh, models in. Secondly, I want to show TensorFlow uh, as, as well. And thirdly, I wanted to show um, model cards. So this is uh, a very um, nascent uh, concept, I suppose, in machine learning. But there's a lot of discussion um, at, at the moment about um, transparency, explainability within machine learning and um, data cards and model cards are uh, a step towards that. So um, it provides information as to um, what data the model was trained on, who developed the model, is there any ethical considerations that we can glean with it, um, what way was the data stratified and so on what type of predictions were made for the model for the, the different classification groups and, and so on. So I'll just, fingers crossed, I'll pop out here and um, hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, can everybody see a... Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. MLMD model card toolkit. Yep, that's brilliant. Thank you, Kathleen. So, right. Um, I'm not going to walk you through everything um, here. I just want to show that it's a fairly um, 
complex uh, example. So, uh, and, and the different parts of your um, machine learning um, pipeline. And also to highlight, this is all in, in Python here as, as well. Uh, and this has come from um, the, the Google AI, the Google blog, I believe this has um, originally come from. So it covers things like, um, you know, setting up your, um, your environment. Um, so I've run that uh, previously there. It's all set up for us. Um, what packages and so on we want to import. So you can see you've got your, your, your TensorFlow um, in here. Uh, and then setting up some paths. And then just to highlight things about um, your data. So UCI also have um, a nice archive of um, data sets that, that you can play about with. And I just wanted to show uh, in, in this part of the example, the amount of effort that's spent on the data side. Um, so you can see here, you've got um, a, a data set. It's related to um, adults. Um, I think it's from one, a, a US consensus data set. So it's got information on a uh, person's age, their education, their marital status, um, and whether or not they're earning over um, 40K, um, 50K thousand um, dollars. And this is what the data set looks like, the type of information in it. Uh, and um, this is a little bit about setting up the output. But here you can see that you're reading in the data, you're taking a look at um, the training examples here. Um, so you have to, you're, you're translating this um, into like a JSON type format. Um, doing a little bit more about um, the statistics then of your data set. So this is really nice. It shows you graphically um, your features. So country, education, marital status. Um, are there uh, missing values here? Are there um, unique values? What's the frequency? How long a length um, particular feature is and, and what, it, what it looks like um, here as, as, as well. Um, and again, this is doing more uh, work in terms of um, defining schemas, um, transforming uh, your, your data then as well. So it can um, fit within the TensorFlow um, and then doing all the pre-processing, filling in missing values, transforming your data and so on. So I think you're getting the general idea that a lot of um, the work is spent on the, the, the data pre-processing pre um, stage. And then here we are doing our training and our, our classification. So I just want to highlight some of the results at the, the end of um, this which is really quite nice in terms of this idea of, of a model card um, toolkit uh, and in terms of explainability. So we're, we're, we're going to see, we, we're seeing machine learning applied in, in many areas now. Um, and um, so for example, say within the financial um, sector and um, being applied to predict whether or not somebody will get a, a loan or will be denied um, a loan. You'll have seen uh, a very famous example from um, Apple. <laughs> Apple um, uh, released a credit card recently um, with, I think it was Goldman Sachs um, was the, the, the bank behind that, that card. And um, the, if, if you were male, it was very likely that you would get the card uh, compared to if you were female. So a lot of people are asking, um, is the model um, that a uh, prediction was made on, is it fair, is it unbiased and so on. And this concept of, of model cards is a step towards um, of, of bringing, bringing that into consideration. So you can see here for this particular model that we built on the um, consensus income classifier, um, I will shall close that. Um, 
it, it, it provides information on the use case, its limitations, um, what ethical considerations should be taken into um, consideration. It has information about the, the training set, um, the evaluation set, um, how it was um, divided up uh, in terms of features, um, different analysis then uh, that was run on that. So I just thought this was very um, interesting to, to highlight that. And that's um, one of the directions in which uh, the the area is 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 going in terms of um, in terms of explainability and and, and transparency. So the second thing I'd like to highlight uh, as oh dear you me sorry I just have to see all this again. Uh, second thing I want to highlight uh, as as well is um, this concept of of technical debt. So at the start of the presentation, uh, I highlighted our team and the skills within our, our team uh, and why you need a diverse team to support um, machine learning. So you can see here, uh, this is a very famous NIPS paper from um, Google, uh, where <laughs> machine learning code is this like tiny little box um, within a whole um, ecosystem. Um, so machine learning models are only one piece of the, the puzzle uh, in terms of getting your model into production. Uh, there's lots of other aspects um, that need to be focused on as well, such as your serving um, infrastructure, how you model, monitor your model once it's in production, um, extracting features, gathering your data and, and, and so on. So this is another aspect um, just to think about as well whenever you're, you're, you're at the start of your um, machine learning um, journey. So I want to show a few things now, what we're doing in terms of um, machine learning. So um, we use Python code. Um, so hopefully everybody's seeing VS code here. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to show uh, that again, a lot, of <laughs> a lot of our work is spent in the pre-processing stage. Um, and to highlight uh, the actual model part. So this couple of lines here is all that's required to um, train <laughs> a machine learning model. Um, whereas all of this here is um, basically uh, generating our, our, our data sets uh, and, and so on. So this code is all part of um, one of our uh, use cases um, within the tactics, which is um, using machine learning to make predictions on matches, uh, for example, entity matches. So this screen here shows um, entities. So entities are like people, um, companies, um, they could be assets such as vehicles uh, uh, and so on. Um, and we are doing a prediction as to, in, in this particular um, example as to whether um, entities are a match or, or not. Uh, and what I really want to show here is um, the, the system and uh, the cyclic um, elements of, of machine learning. So you can see here that uh, we've got this entity access point and um, we have found uh, a, a match to um, another um, entity uh, access point um, within a, a different um, data set. And uh, our model is saying, I'm really confident that this is a, um, prediction of, uh, of a match here. And it's also given us some information um, as to why it, uh, it thinks that it is a, a match. And I wanna highlight here um, the human in the loop machine learning. So this is where you can um, capture subject matter expertise into your, your um, model process. Um, so here, we are highlighting what uh, the model thinks is a match uh, or, or a non-match and a subject um, 
expert could either agree or disagree with this um, prediction. And really what we're doing there is that we're capturing their rationale and we're adding that to our training data. So whenever we retrain the model at a later date, it should be able to make um, more, more accurate um, predictions. Um, and then to highlight some of the scaffolding uh, around this. So you can see this is like new data that's been added. We can retrain a model um, later on. And then we can also monitor a model once it's in production, which is really, really important. So this highlights um, uh, an interface here, which uh, is monitoring our model in, in, in real time in a production environment. So models can drift and um, their performance can uh, degrade over time. So it's important to keep an eye on that. Um, so you can see here that our models are doing fine at the minute, but if we've seen a dip, then we'd know that there's something wrong. Um, and we also monitor our data as well. So we're monitoring here how close is um, the data that we're making predictions on to the data that the model was trained on as, as well. So this is, this is doing a, a health check um, on our models. Um, and then this is one more little thing. Oops. Uh, we can also use explainability metrics as well um, to explain why a particular prediction was was made by a, a model. So um, again, I realize I went over that um, very quick. So I'd just like to um, conclude uh, with some um, recommendations. Um, uh, O'Reilly's really good for um, books. Um, I know I've highlighted a couple of um, books previous or previously um, in, in the presentation here this evening. And uh, O'Reilly has a data and AI newsletter that comes out each week. And it's very good at keeping up to date of what's happening in the area. Um, to think of models as uh, sitting in a system. So to um, think of how you productionize your model in terms of the testing involved and APIs and monitoring and, and so on. Um, Medium, Katie, Nuggets, Kaggle competitions are a really nice way to uh, get, get started in the area. Um, these are a few people who I um, follow. So Andrew Ng, um, Cassie Kozovok and um, Ali Miller. And there's a really good um, podcast called The, the Data Skeptic um, as, as well. Uh, and also some um, resources from depending where, where, where you are um, in your machine learning journey. So if you're new to Python, um, there's some uh, nice Python programming courses. Um, there's some nice Udemy courses um, as well. It focuses on um, ML ops and production machine learning. Um, and uh, this is a really nice um, uh introduction to production machine learning as as well so that's that's um a very quick overview of who we are and what we do and um uh, a, a brief introduction into to starting into uh machine learning so i'm very happy to take um questions or to answer questions after uh, as as well um, yeah, thanks very much, Fiona. That talk was both fantastic and intriguing. Um, there's one wee question in the chat box there. Are you happy enough to read it? Or I can call it out if you prefer. Uh, uh, I can read see. it out. If oh, yeah, want. please do. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's from Greg. And he says, quick question for me. How important is explainability in the KYC slash AML space for your clients? And also from a regulatory perspective? Um, that's a very um, interesting and, and, and timely um, question. So our clients are primarily uh, within the, the financial sector, um, highly regulated um, sector. And whenever we first started developing models um, within the tactics, it was just essential that um, our models were transparent and explainable um, because it, it was just re required um, by, by this um, 
by by this sector. Um, in terms of of regulation uh, as as well, so I currently sit on the the Bank of England FCA AI Public Private Forum and. Um, how to regulate um, machine learning in finance is is what we're um, discussing at at the moment as as well. So those things in terms of data cards, model cards, explainability, um, and maybe auditing against them is is one area that's that's currently um, coming coming up. Um, in in general, um, I see transparency and explainability as being very important in terms of building trust with the, the, the public, um, especially as um, ML is going to become ubiquitous across all, all sectors. So being able to explain why a particular prediction was made as to whether or not you're refused a loan or whether you're, you're provided a, a, a diagnosis. Um, People want to know why why that was why that was done. So, which features drove that um, prediction? Um, how the the data set was generated? Um, how it was divided up? Was it representative? And 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 so on. So, these are the very important um, questions uh, which are are being um, discussed at the moment and. Following from that, there's 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 many different AI um, guidelines and ethics and so on that that are being um, written up as as well. So I don't know if that answered the question, <laughs> or 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 not. Ease, um, Greg's just put in the chat. Thanks, Fiona. So okay. you must have been spot on. <laughs> Went over my head a wee bit. I don't know what KYC and AML oh. mean. <laughs> So, um, so, so it's 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 no it's know your customer. So, um, and an anti money laundering. So, for example, say you are a financial institution and you're onboarding a new a new client, you you essentially want to make sure that they're not dodgy. <laughs> so, um, that's uh, that's that's one uh one of the processes where machine learning is being um implemented because onboarding clients um can can take uh quite a long time uh in terms of all the checks that 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 you need to do uh and then anti-money laundering i suppose could stem from um onboarding a dodgy client so you don't want to have somebody in your system who is using uh your your bank to wash um their their money that they've obtained from a uh, uh, illegal means and um and within this sector it's highly regulated and if institutions get it wrong um they're slapped for very heavy fines as as well well that, that that's something i definitely didn't know about <laughs> or know to consider at all so i've learned something tonight for sure um, does anyone else in the chat have any uh, questions? You can either unmute your mic or pop it in the window and I'll, I'll set it for you. I have a question here uh, myself, uh, Kathleen. Uh, Fiona, great talk. Um, so one of my questions was uh, later on in the year, we'll be planning to do a hackathon. And uh, from one of the previous years, uh, one challenge we had was uh, the data that was provided, you know, on the day was very dirty, put it that mm -hmm. way, and spent a lot of time doing a good bit of cleaning. Uh, looking forward, would you kind of recommend even having, I suppose, like two sessions where one's focused on the, the prepping and then the second's actually focused on the training, uh, you know, to, I suppose, get the best output because we're just obviously trying to get the best use out of what tends to be about 10 hours. But I would love to hear any thoughts that you have on that. Mm. Yeah, I think my, my first thought would be um, don't don't clean up the data before <laughs> before you have the hackathon because yeah. um, like uh, what is it like 60 to 80 percent of your time is going to be spent in the data prep side. And it's really important um, to, to go through all of those steps. Yeah. So, so yeah, that sounds like a great idea uh, in terms of dividing it up into, you know, the data prep, feature engineering, labeling part of the, the the process, and then 
the second part, um, training and evaluating your models. Fair enough. No, that's spot on. Thanks. One for me, uh, Fiona. Um, th thank you for the presentation, by the way. It was, it was really good. Um, just on your background about academia, so you, you've you been in academia, and they have a habit of using MATLAB for just about everything. Uh, is MATLAB dead? Is this the end of it? And, and maybe you could shed some light on um, why Python's so good or not good. Um, I'll, I'll maybe summarize my experience with MATLAB. So yes, um, my first day of my PhD, uh, I went in and opened up MATLAB and uh, I went to load in a genomic data set where MATLAB promptly fell over uh, because <laughs> it tried to load everything into the RAM and it just wasn't um, happening. So MATLAB never worked for me, unfortunately. Um, so I've never I've never used um, MATLAB. Um, I've actually used R mainly in in in, in academia uh, and then uh, in and then a bit in Python, but out in the industry, um, uh, Python all, all, all the way. And I suppose mainly because it's, it seems to be for us to be better suited to our needs uh, in terms of all the packages that are available, the sport that is available, the open source, and also the production side of it as, um, as, as well. But I think what I would say with my teaching hat on again is um, if you have one language, you have them all, you know, so it's just the, the syntax is, 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 is a bit different. So as long as you got the fundamentals, you should be fine. Let's hope for us yet then. Hi. <laughs> um, oh, go ahead there. I was, I was going, <laughs> Jinx, you go ahead, Darren. Uh, yeah, it was just a question for yourself, Fiona. And uh, I don't really know about the size of data and stuff that you would be uh, piping through your training. Uh, generally, do how long would you train a model for? Maybe in its, in its initial stages, would it be hours to kind of get some feedback on it? Or would you, you know, you know your process is so well, you know, three days will get you to a certain degree of accuracy and then you would start to fine tune it maybe yeah so that's that's an interesting um one um so how long does it take us to train our our models so we don't have um deep deep learning um models um one because um we couldn't explain them <laughs> so that was one, one of the reasons why um we we don't and two because um other uh sort of more traditional models did did a good job for us um oh, okay. so we don't have masses amount of of data that that say a deep learning model would would would, would require um i suppose the areas which are time consuming uh is um feature generation so for example if, if we're if we're doing like calculating co-occurrence values which is it's like a massive permutation test um that's going to take us a while and uh we'll try to to streamline that by threading and 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 so on um so generating features can be a bit of a bottleneck um for us uh but the actual once our features have been generated and we we run them through a model that's not really a bottleneck for us it's relatively um fast okay so uh so yeah it depends but if we had a deep yeah, learning yeah. model that's going to be completely different uh, uh again so cool cool no thank you So I was just going to ask one question, which might be obvious, but I'm curious. <laughs> um, from your experience, what type of model do you think is the most common in the industry um, in the sense of supervised, unsupervised or reinforcement? So, uh, right, I'm going to answer this in two, two ways. Um, firstly, to highlight that um, if you've looked at anything in the media and you think of machine learning you'll you'll just think that the only 
type of machine learning that you have is deep learning neural networks. Um, and that's that's not the case. Um, I would go back to um, saying there's there's no it's that no free lunch theorem. So there's no one model that's 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 perfect. Um, and really the the model that that you select shouldn't be because it's the most popular model. It it should be really because um, it's the best model for the particular data that that you have. Um, so for example, support vector machines are very powerful, but they don't handle missing data very well. So perhaps looking at a, a Bayesian, like naive Bayesian, Bayesian network would be more appropriate. So really letting um, your, your problem um, domain, um, if you have labels or not on, on, on your data uh, and uh, the data itself to, to lead you towards which um, model to, to select. Um, so yeah, they all have their advantages and, and, and their disadvantages. Um, and one that could work very well in one particular area may be abysmal in, in, in another. So again, it sort of goes back to the, the whole know, 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 know your data. Oh, and be very skeptical as, as well as a machine learning um, practitioner. Um, if you get really good classification results, it's probably because um, your your data set's unbalanced or something like that. So, um, yeah, so that's, I, I think I went to three things there. Sorry about that, Kathleen. No, that's perfect. Because um, starting out, sometimes you think you need to know what model first, but it's good to know from somebody with such experience, their perspective, that it's the data you should think about first rather than the model. So, yeah, that answered um, answered it perfectly. If everyone's happy enough, we'll move on to Darren, or is there any more questions? No, okay, so that's uh, perfect. So <clears throat> the next speaker tonight is Darren, who's a senior software engineer at Liberty IT, and he's gonna talk about getting started with AI and ML too. Um, hear me okay, Kathleen, and see my um, slide deck okay? Yeah, perfect. Can hear you and see everything clearly. Cool. Um, yeah, no, thanks, uh, Jonathan and Fiona. Uh, it was teaching me so much. I was, uh, might as well change the slide deck on the fly for all the, all the things that I've learned so far. Um, yep, so these are kind of like at least my recommendations for the path that I've taken into bits of uh, AI and, and ML. So a wee bit about me first. Um, so my name's Darren Broderick. Um, there was a, a nickname, uh, feel free to use it. <laughs> I'm a senior software developer at Liberty Information Technology. So LIT in, in Belfast. Um, we have an office as well down in Dublin. Um, I'm also a AbilityNet charity. Um, it's a UK run charity. It's a technical volunteers, so people who have issues with um, anything tech-wise, whether it's emails or setting up um, uh, their home laptops or anything like that, it's kind of like a, a phone or, or a, like a call round service uh, once, uh, once COVID restrictions are reduced again. Um, I would see myself as an ML newcomer, uh, still even though I've kind of tinkered in the space, I'm not an ML, ML engineer or I don't uh, work daily in it, but I like to use them um, pretty much all the innovation time uh, I've got working in that space, which is um, something LIT really encourages folks to do is, uh, is take innovation uh, days during the week or at the end of like our sprint cycles um, or the end of like quarterly sprint cycles, if you just didn't keep increasing it in terms of time. Um, I'm an AWS deep research enthusiast. It'll be uh, the first thing I'll, I'll talk about and it's kind of like my, my route into, into the world of ML and AI. I'm a member of the AWS Community Builders Program, which I'll talk about as well. I think it's a, something really, really useful thing for any person uh, of any level to consider uh, joining, um, not just for ML, but it's definitely useful in that space. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. And um, yeah, I was someone who was definitely overwhelmed by the, the thought of ML and 
but really wanted to either know more about it or work in it. And I'm, I'm still like that. I still want to get more involved in all aspects, um, especially in the workplace. So I've a wee bit of a, a piece on that as well about uh, what's in progress and what's hopefully coming soon for us. So um, if this isn't too nerdy as a, as a content slide, we have our neural network here. So I'm going to input here um, details about deep racer, Keras and TensorFlow, which has been mentioned before. And so uh, I don't have as many new details there, but just a kind of project I've, uh, I've run during that. Uh, with the builder program, a bit of CDK, um, things that you can do with machine learning as well, but learn other types of uh, patterns and, and technologies. And some natural language processing, which is a small thing I've started tinkering with uh, that's currently in progress too. And uh, what's hidden in between all the slides is reinforcement learning, which is what DeepRacer brings to us. Uh, data science as well, so it's a really useful icebreaker in that space. There's something called Jenkin. Um, and some resources that I've, I've found useful and um, continue to use. Um, what's been output from all that is maybe some questions from yourselves and also um, the, a machine learning AI guild that I've started in my workplace. Uh, very, very new. It's uh, maybe five days old um, and kind of like what's, what our goals are and why we're doing that. So uh, what is Deep Racer? It's it's definitely a lot of fun and it's Amazon's solution to getting people interested in machine learning. Um, I think ML would be seen as a very high tier learning rate, uh, which is also a good machine learning point, I guess. But um, it's not as easy to just imagine what you could use ML for or how you could get started learning it. So this is basically a small car um, with cameras that learn how to race around the track by itself. Uh, it's very, very easy to get started. 15 minutes and you can, you can understand what, what you kind of want from it, but more difficult to master. And master in the sense that uh, this is run very competitively and how to be extremely competitive is the master level. But for learning purposes, I think it still has a lot to offer um, going forward for all types of general machine learning, especially like beginner concepts, hyperparameters, um, overfitting them and things like that, but I'll talk about those as well. And for the most part, it's 99% autonomous. Uh, you, um, if it's a really good model, it'll go around the track by itself, but the object is to get around a wee bit quicker than your competitors. So you have control over a percentage throttle, which is really just the, the battery output to the motors and not in the sense of an actual speed value. So this is it in action. Uh, this is in reInvent in Vegas. Uh, this is the championships that were run at the end of 2019. Um, so what's going on here is we have a pit crew guy. The rules are if it goes off the track, it goes back on as long as one wheel touches any part of the white. So um, there's a really, really good TV series done called uh, Deep Racer TV that's uh, on Prime and uh, YouTube. It goes through 2019. Um, and coming up to the end of it for the championships in different cities, different AWS summits, and running those competitions. And it's a, it's a bit of excitement, people on the leaderboard going up and down. And it's very, um, it's uh, very edited very well for, for like last minute uh, winners and world records and things like that. So that's the idea there. It's, it's definitely a lot of fun um, as well as, as a lot of learning because the, the more you learn, the more you are likely to win in a sense, the more you can understand about your model, how it operates, the decisions it makes is, is all paramount if you want to try and get on that podium. So um, that's what reinforcement learning is. And in a way you're reinforced learning yourself as well because it's, it's, it's incentive driven. So that, that's how it works. We've got an environment here, um, which is our track, which is we've seen before, but we all train it virtually on AWS RoboMaker and policy updates go through AWS SageMaker as well. So already you're starting to get a wee bit of a exposure to those uh, powerful services as well as what they can do. Um, things like state reward and the value, they're pieces of parameters and environment variables that the car takes when it goes around the track, uh, decides based on something called a reward, which I have an example of as well. Uh, it's just a, a float value a number representing of how um, 
how well it's done in comparison to how you've written your function. And its only goal is to get a high number. And um, whether that results in a good lap time or not is up to your code, um, which I'll show as well. And then the state gets passed into the policy and the car gets updated and the neural network weights get applied to the actions, which is just a, a JSON, um, just a JSON a key value pair of your speed and your steering. Um, and they get matched to like a probability where 50% likely if it goes along the straight, it will use a straight speed and a straight steering angle. And that's really it. It's just processing with image classification. It sees in black and white to help focus on the features, which is going to be the white part of the track and the center line. Um, watching the video again, it might make a bit more sense that it's uh, trying to either hug the white line or not go off in any sense. But that's what your reward is trying to achieve as well. Cool. So uh, this, this guy is called uh, David Smith. He's a well, the guys in the track are called, they're called AWS Pit Crew. And um, so they're, they're uh, responsible for resetting your car and trying to get um, trying to get you the best time as well. Um, but what he's doing for us, he, he's actually breaking the ice for a deep racer. And it breaks the ice as well for a lot of different areas that I've kind of talked about, but just to, just to put on the screen. And um, it gives you a main machine learning concept. So you have reinforcement learning. And as the folks before me talked, you have uh, supervised and unsupervised. The difference with RL is it's a lot simpler. It's you mostly see it for things like invitation and maybe advertising would be another good one as well. Things with like, you could imagine what would be a single uh, outcome, like a, an outcome that you would you would want to see happen, whether that's amount of clicks or a fast lap time or a, a bot learning how to navigate a path through obstacles. Um, but it's really, really good because it doesn't require any data up front. It makes its own data in the sense that it banks all the images that it's got and matches those to the probability matrix uh, based on going left, right, or straight and choosing the speed between those. Um, so yeah, uh, exposure issue, just to AWS cons as well, even if you're new to AWS, it, that's another nice uh, way to get involved. And CLI tools, there's a lot of handy uh, features you can use there just for working with S3 and um, running some of your, your training, uh, simple things that you never think um, are difficult uh, once you get over these kind of small humps. Um, S3, I am, um, SageMaker, RoboMaker, EC2, Kinesis and CloudWatch, all these things you can work together. You can choose to run these at, at, at parts individually or all together. And um, it gives you a soft introduction to data science through Jupyter Notebook as well. Um, I have an example of that. Um, there's some really good Jupyter Notebooks pre-set up and all you need to do is um, load that locally and it's all good to go. You can just click run by cell and you can take your time understand what each what each line is doing or not at all, just see the output that you're interested in and kind of take a, an appreciation for uh, what, uh, what good data um, can, can really show you. Um, yep, and you can use SageMaker. You can take, you, you can use the DeepRacer service itself you can use SageMaker or you can abstract all of those and run these things locally on your machine, either through EC2 or if you've got a, enough, uh, enough RAM on your, on your laptop, you can run it there as well. It, it will try to take off, so I would recommend you know, 16 gigabytes or more possibly. Um, and the, you start to learn the concepts about overfitting and, and conversion. So I'll talk about those as well soon, but uh, the idea is overfitting is the idea that the car is not very good physically because it's been trained for too long. Um, and the same goes for other models where the training data is just maybe got steel and it's only really good at recognizing training data again rather than any new or fresh data. So uh, yeah, reinforcement learning, kind of what I've mentioned before, but in the general ML space, you have your reinforcement learning Supervised if you have your labels uh, defined that you want, or unsupervised if you just have a data set and you want to have the labels pulled out of them as well. But RL being, being the simplest, I believe. Uh, this is what a function looks like. This is provided uh, for free by Amazon. There's a, there's a few different examples. Uh, what was really going on here is the idea that your reward that I mentioned uh, before is returned based on how well the model is done based on certain markers you've set. Uh, you can change all of this as well. You can import loads of different Python libraries. So this really gets you 
um, a nice easy way into Python, I think as well, because it's simple to start with. It just uses if statements uh, and you can expand upon that or even uh, expose this to Lambda as well if you wanted to. But the idea here is you've got parameters that, the, that is, are available to you, such as the track width, distance from the center, and then you've just worked out markers and you give them based a reward based on how close it stayed to the center line on line 16, 17. If it's uh, closer to marker one, which is 10% uh, of it, it's, uh, it's a higher reward. But as it drifts further away from that center line, you'll reward it less. And with each episode, 15 times a second, it's capturing these images and making decisions on what to do and returning that reward. So, um, and that that's that's the only kind of new uh, code you would need to write, or you can just keep that as is and see what's what's being done for you. So hyperparameters, um, all of this is so new to me. I left all of these at default. I would recommend you do the same as well, just to get a feeling for what each of these do. And over the months that I spent on deep research, what I did was I just took each one and analyzed what it did in isolation. Um, AWS deep research, really good docs and all of this stuff, but you can learn any of these just generally just with a quick Google. Um, but each of them are so, so important, maybe more so than others, but messing with these that without the understanding is a quick way to turn a, a good model bad or never get a good model. And you think it's something within your code, but it just it's just some tweaking here. Um, but yeah, I would just take each one in, in your stride. Uh, the defaults are there for a reason though. Amazon have done a lot of auto ML on this stuff and find that generally these are, are good to start with. Um, although one tip, I would reduce the discount factor. I would take a like a thousand off that. I would take that down to not nine nine. Um, when you learn about that, that's telling you that it's seen a thousand steps in the future. That, that that's basically almost two or three laps of a track. You only need it to see as far as one one complete lap. So a hundred steps is a good place to start. So it helps tie it all together, uh, not just for deep racer, but also. Um, the more I've seen about other ML spaces and data science, a lot of similar concepts seem to take place that really, how you define your hyperparameters, if you're not understanding what you're doing there for training, the function you write, or even the data you use, which is the track. And in this case, you can give the you can give the car actions that it could never complete on the track, the same way you could give a model of data it could never um, hope to train against or predict against future data. So things like that, you already start to understand a wee bit more. Um, running evaluations of your model against real data. Uh, the conversion of this is a physical track. is so, so different to a virtual track as in training your model with your test data might not prepare for the real world. So it's worth considering that those differences in your evaluations could show massive differences in your predictions where you're getting 90% data you're getting 10% in the real world. So just things to stop you on your way to learning those. And generally, um, the, generally, the more you train, prediction results improve. But what I've seen with deep race in particular is overfitting comes uh, very fast once you, um, once you push it past the limits that it can't learn anymore. Some of those high parameters can help you squeeze out a wee bit more learning without overfitting it. But generally, you'll want to focus on doing really good uh, training metric, uh, analyzing when it's uh, learning as well. You're watching how it's learning and seeing is there is there is the time to stop that and, and give it new data or try a new model with different parameters. So a lot of it is very, very trial and error, especially in uh, the space of deep racer. And I've seen similar areas that sometimes you just have to try uh, a set of uh, parameters on a new function. Um, just to get an idea if you've made any improvements. And if you are going to make, try and make improvements, I would generally think of changing just one element. Maybe that's one parameter, one action, one change in your function, just so you can really start to compare the differences and try and keep other things constant, like your, your training times and, and things like that, and how you analyze them. Uh, but it's better to generalize a model feeding it fresh data. I find uh, I'm in deep racer thoughts, training on different tracks, different track shapes, um, the one I've provided here is um, the standard kind of like overly shape, but is the one in this video is a lot wider, uh, a lot has a lot more corners and it's longer as well. So combining those can give you a much better model.
Yeah, you can do that with maybe parallel training or just cloning a, a model and continuing that with a new track. Um, so we get a lot of data science points as well. Um, this is just kind of small snippets of single lines like this because you've got your uh, definitions done in the utils function, which um, are all provided um, in the DeepRacer community logs. Um, they'll just show up nice, nice graphs. So you can choose to run them and just appreciate there, or you can start to uh, import your pandas and numpy and actually start to see line by line what's really going on. Um, I think that's a really good way to learn because it's 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 data, it's data that you've made as well. So you can be a bit more invested there too. So um Kiras, and that's sorry, that's that's it for the, the deep racer side of things. So the, the next part is that Kiras TensorFlow and uh, something called Jenkin, which is uh, it's, it's just a rock, paper, scissors AI. It's not a not a lag or anything like that. It's um it's a name I chose because it's the original uh, Chinese name for the game. So just uh, just called it by its roots. And um, yeah, it's just Keras and TensorFlow and a neural network um, that was pre-built called SqueezeNet, which I used. Um, if you want to mention as well, like if there's models out there already doing the job for you, re reuse them if they're pre-built and trained. Um, training time instead of days or weeks to build this took it down to five to 10 minutes. Um, that's a lot of time and possible money uh, being saved there too. Uh, but Keras, as I've explained before, it's just a core, a core API within TensorFlow, and TensorFlow itself is an open source library used for machine learning. And both of those together are how we'll train our inference our neural networks, so how, how we use our models after we train them as well. Um, and that's kind of in action in the next slide here, but just to show the text, um, with the NumPy, it's SqueezeNet and something called OpenCV, which is a Python library for how I made that game window. So not, nothing machine learning, but just a good way to kind of show it off. Um, so the steps I followed, yep, gather your own data. <laughs> Luckily for me, I, I created my own. And that's when I quickly learned uh, the importance of bias. <laughs> that uh, I, I suspected it would only play well against me and not other people. But I started to realize that my three images of rock, paper, and scissors weren't enough. I needed to start to grasp a lot of different backgrounds, different times of day for lighting, lights on and off in, in the room, um, as well as reaching out to the teams to get them just to submit pictures to an S3 bucket that I then copied in and trained my model on. And that, that vastly improved it. Uh, it always seemed to do well against me, but once I started playing it against other people, uh, which I believe I show at the end of this video, it, it mostly does quite well against me and then the best two out of three. So the, the images were just index labeled, just uh, those four were each zero to zero to three. So that just made it super fast. So I was uh, I was assigning the labels to the data. Uh, how I trained it, uh, use squeeze nets. So very similar to Fiona's example of a small piece just defined to um, uh, showing the, the hyperparameters used and the activation function and how many epochs you want to go around. So I chose 10. It's what I'm used to for deep racer. I only had 600 images, so that took about five minutes, and that gave it something like 93% accuracy um, whenever I test against a 20% test image. Uh, and then to actually test the model in the real world, I just used the webcam the same way I took the images. It was just uh, statically through the webcam. I just uh, had an, uh, a tool scan in my hand as I, as I moved it around, and uh, OpenCV built that kind of UI that, that's being run on. Um, there's a lot to there. I, was, uh, I didn't want to try in the talk with this one, so I kind of flooded the code with comments. So um, I can supply these in any form as well, but um, GitHub down, bro, and you can see all my repos, but the rock, paper, scissors is the, the one that has it all. And uh, there's training scripts there that have just maybe got one line, but like 10 lines of commented code above it, just explaining why I chose it and what I've understood that it does. And uh, I read a medium article as well that kind of does a, a general overview of uh, different decisions made and different things I find out that could be improved as well. But the, the readme is good if you want to just run through the whole project and understand from scratch how you, how you could build it. Um, so you could just clone that as well. So the DataRest Community Builders Program, I joined this program last September um, or last August. And 
the applications uh, for the next quarter have just uh, just finished, but they'll open again, I believe, in August or end of July. So it's a program that offers technical resources, uh, mentorship, and uh, network opportunities. Um, it's mostly hosted within a Slack channel space, but that is just a means of communicating all the information that you can you can lead, reach out to, whether you go to different tech talks, sync up with uh, other leads or SMEs about um, different subject matters, and there's different channels for each piece. When you join, you you say the area that you're most interested in, which is for me, machine learning. So uh, there's so many people you're slotted into like a, a subset of default channels. So you're not too overwhelmed to begin with. And um, they just ask that you're passionate about sharing knowledge and connecting the tackle community. So uh, you can apply and give your reasons uh, why you want to join, what you hope to achieve and what you could hope to, to share out as well. And yet massive area of connections, good soft skill building skills and data opportunities. So new services could come out from machine learning that you could get a front front line to see. And um, just it gives you support for innovations and, and actually AWS certifications as well. So this is kind of the general advantages. Um, you can level up your skills. Uh, there's a lot of ML tech leads. Folks have actually written these services are available to, to chat to. So even if you have issues, um, you probably get, instead of being on the phone to technical support or anything like that, you'll probably get responses back in minutes for things and maybe just calls to help sort that out. Um, you get cert vouchers, so you can um, do any certification you choose, even the, the AWS ML one. And uh, reinvent ticket discounts, swags, and um, the Cloud uh, Academy subscription is really good as well. So that's another chance to kind of uh, find more ML talks that are, um, you know, without having to pay for them. And there's loads of good tutorials as well. They're just kind of put out in, in announcements. Um, but the, this, these are the four that you would be most interested in going in, I, I suspect, for an ML AI point of view, where uh, these things are just straight away, you can start chatting to either program members who are still there or new uh, AWS tech leads that are either going to share you new stuff that they're doing, or you'll be able to talk to them the stuff that you're trying to figure out or experiment with. And uh, just as an incentive, there's a, there's the swag kit, so you get um, all these little cool things and uh, $500 of credit to use as well. So it's a good chance to experiment with maybe uh, some services that can be a bit pricey, like a SageMaker, without, um, without worrying about paying up front. You can, you can try these things out with some free credits. Um, so yeah, just to kind of finish off what I've got in progress, I've got a NLP uh, linter processor, which came up as a, as a group that I've really found interesting. And it's just a, a free text feature finder. So what I'm trying to do with that is uh, take that in and provide it with any type of uh, docx converter, and then just find the features that I'm interested in. This example is just find in months. And then um, It'd be very interesting to see what that could do with the large insurance documents, and it's it's lightning quick as well. So um, you could just help the user define what they want to see, and maybe start to label unknown documents as well, or even just get a feel for um, what kind of document this is, or uh, does it does it meet certain standards as well? Um, and that's all just uh, just uh, that's all just Python scripting. It's um, very very low level and very quick. Uh, the slightly higher level one I'm working on is uh, three CDK, so the Amazon's like deployment for their cloud uh, storage stuff. The recognition area is the, is the ML core within it. So the idea here is I have just some React GI set an image uh, into an S3, and then a Lambda picks that image up, all sends it through the recognition service, and then analyzes the features labels within that image and stores all that in Dynamo. Um, so that's what the architecture is building up, and that's what's in progress too. Um, so it's just been a really fun way to be keeping ML, but also keep very relevant for what's uh, what's currently used by industry standard as well, and um, do whatever it um, takes to uh, keep those costs down as to and keep your deployments quick. So uh, I mentioned level up before on the community thing, but it's, it's a good chance to start to do it. And I think um, when you don't level up and you have the chance to, it's something you regret whenever an opportunity comes you by. So it's, a, it's words of encouragement, but 
there um it's so easy to delay learning the stuff that um it took racing a car around a track for me to finally uh you know start to commit a lot of time to this stuff um but it's hard and, and it's still relatively new and gaining popularity so there's an endless amount of opportunity and, and space to to learn it and lead in your in your team and work and um, there are definitely multiple avenues um i didn't mention at the start but i was also a mechanical engineering uh, degree and i switched to an msc masters and now i'm just doing this in innovation time so um I don't know whether it's going to be part of your work day, you know, 25 percent or it starts to feed into more and more as, as you get uh, more used to it. But what I would like to say is um, the area is so interesting. There's so many free and learning resources available that um, if something like a data driven project came across your team or your area and um, far better that you're showing that you're learning the skills or have a few already than that work to, to miss you and uh, you don't get a chance to work on it. So, um, not Scott Pilgrim, anyone, anyone likes that film, I just thought that was a good idea for it. Um, so yeah, what I would recommend to start with is uh, NumPy and Pandas. Uh, what I was showing at the little snippet of the deep issue, it's basically your main areas of data manipulation. And again, it gives you another exposure to Python getting started, I think, at that level, because that's going to be what you're always probably going to import to start with to create your data set. And, clean it up and, and define it the way you need to. And then you have a choice, you don't have to do both these. SageMaker is simpler by nature because I think I said before, it abstracts a lot of complications. There's really, really good tutorials out there, which I've, I've got a recommendation for. And you can train, predict, deploy and present all of it within uh, just a single instance. Um, but it can get a bit pricey. So you can do all of these things yourself as well with the Jupyter Notebook, but you can just run locally. and um, it wouldn't take a, any more effort, but I think tackling the two at some point really gets you an idea because within SageMaker, you have the Jupyter Notebook, but taking that out and running the notebook might be all you need for your, uh, your learning experiences to start with before you want to think about what you actually need to deploy and, and use in the, in the production world. Um, so yeah, the resources for these skills for NumPy and Pandas, I would either recommend if you're getting into the deeper world, the deeper community, just Google and that will bring up the first link of the log analysis repo that you can just clone and download. And once you've installed your notebook packages, you can just type the words and it will start a local host server for you. And um, hackerearth.com, um, they were really, really good NumPy and Pandas explanation and just taking you through some really basic cells about what, uh, what those libraries give you and what, they can, what you can do going forward. For SageMaker, the Pluralsight Labs, I have a picture of it because I think it's it's fantastic. I'd only found this a few weeks ago that um, it will give you the keys to the kingdom for an hour and you can run all of the code that you can copy and paste. You just sign an incognito window in Chrome and it will give you your AWS logins and keys and you have no need to worry and you just get started straight away with learning. and. Um, you may feel the time pressure for an hour, but to actually get through most of the tutorials is maybe 25, 30 minutes. Most of that time is the SageMaker spinning up or the data being trained because uh, they're quite large data sets that they give you. And then Jupyter Notebook, if you wanted to run this locally, um, it's completely free. I find their, their own docs are, are really, really good. They just explain it so well from a, from a starting point of view. And that's just Jupyter Notebook, uh, read the docs. So just any quotes, you can just straight Google. Um, that's why I didn't want to throw up links that no one would be able to to write up or type in time. But um, uh, those those three, I think, are, are really good places to start. Um, and an example of just you know, kind of like a timeline as well as uh, what labs looks like. But just if you want to get involved, the deepers community, that's the link there. Hopefully it's short enough that it's just join.deepracer.io. But maybe just deep research community will get you to the Slack. Uh, I'm one of the admins as well, so hopefully you'll think of joining some time and I'll, I'll prove you or someone will. Um, you can clone any of my repos. Uh, pull requests are welcome too. So um, this rock, paper, scissors one is there as well as the, the CDK one I'm working on and another QRS TensorFlow, which is just a very small beginner pr prediction model that you could train in like 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, but yeah, just github.com slash Um. And then 
If you're interested, the a plan to the Builders Community Program again. You can just Google Builders Community Program. It'll bring you up in the first first link that when the next uh, applications come out, and you can just have it email you when that when that happens. Um, and I, I don't think it hurts to, to apply and it shows, gives you an idea of writing down what you really want and help maybe express some of your goals that uh, you want to get through either with machine learning or anything, but uh, in particular, if you're interested in machine learning, they've got a lot to offer. Um, and this is what the labs looks like. So whenever you sign in, it will give you your uh, account ID and I am username and a password. Just copy this straight into an incognito window that you open in AWS, the main console. And then through that, they will just have cells you can copy and paste. A timer will appear on the top left, and you can you can just go nuts and, and build uh, whatever it asks you to. And you can go through them multiple times as well, um, just so you can start to analyze what you've what you've built. And then it all shuts down when you're done, and you can you can push the time further out if you needed to as well a few times. Um, so lastly, just kind of like a mock time. And I thought today you've been at the conference, so give yourself. 5% towards your goal of maybe working with ML or AI because there's some really, really good talks and resources I think been thrown at you. Um, tomorrow, um, if you're following the kind of route that I followed, the each month a new league starts with the deep research. So for maybe April and May, you could explore those leagues and um, there's a beginner and pro. So you can definitely start in a world that isn't all as competitive and the beginner space will have its own leaderboard. Um, learn about RL, training your first model. Um, if you join the race that I'm in and beat me, you do lose points. So <laughs> do be careful. I'll, uh, I'll deduct minus points for that. Um, and um, uh, maybe in June, you would look at the Pluralsight Labs. I've, I've shown you there 55 minutes to an hour and a half. And um, then look to like Jupyter and Notebook locally. And then when August comes around, the builder's application would open. And then for the next few months, you could take what you've learned and maybe try and build something or mentor uh, members of your team. Um, it's kind of a rough guide, I thought, that maybe you could um, get, uh, follow or, or edit. So uh, lastly, uh, coming soon, hopefully to uh, everyone, uh, that it's an ML AI guild I've started within work. And the idea there is that we're um, going to mentor and learn together, uh, create ideas that are really, really useful for the business and try and bring those ideas through to production models and collaborate with data scientists that are starting to be hired as well. Um, and for myself, finishing those two main projects that I've shown on the CDK and NLP, uh, and if possible, driving that production model forward within my team. And uh, another another deep research final in, in a reInvent 2021 would be nice too. And that is me. Um, I'm right on the money for eight o'clock. So, sorry, I have no time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant, Darren. Um, thanks so much. I will open the floor to any questions real quick, if that's okay with you. I know yeah, we're running yeah. a little bit on. Oh, no, I was only joking. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, if any anyone in the audience has any questions, fire away. Uh, so I'm seeing one in the chat here, so I'll just read it out for you, um, oh, Darren, if that's you. okay. Yeah. So it's from Greg. He says, I'm doing a PhD in autonomous vehicles. I'm curious, what was your biggest challenge in terms of deep racer and what developer kit you used? That's a really good question. The, definitely in the autonomous vehicle side, that's really, that's really cool because it, they're trying to explore a lot of that as well, you, you can see what they're trying to achieve. Um, I'll click back as I'm talking, but the like that that small car, I think they're hoping at some point will be a larger car, maybe a go-kart, um, and maybe something like Deep Racer would be um, something they would have different people uh, go to different venues within reInvent. The biggest challenge definitely for me was either getting started trying to understand what was the goal of the reinforcement model uh, the idea that you're rewarding is the incentive as well as the training. Um, but now it's a lot of the focus is on how to actually get a good conversions quickly. So a lot of the time I spend working on these hyperparameters. Oh, I went past them. 
and trying to like optimize the training and, and get to the end goal quicker from a time point of view, but also just an expense point of view, because everything you're training on is some type of instance that's running that's using a lot of memory. So um, yeah, that the biggest challenge I face because your data is there for you for a deep racer anyway, that you're trying to just optimize your training quickly, I think. That that was um, interesting. A PhD in autonomous vehicles does sound yeah, fascinating. <laughs> Maybe um, you'll be doing a talk on that at some point too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would question. I would question um, my person back is how, how do you apply? <laughs> Sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, um, he says great. Thanks very much. And he also said that your talk was amazing. So that's brilliant. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Greg. Does anyone else have any questions oh, for Darren? Oh, the link to ProSolabs. Yep, yep, I'll do that. Nine. Yep, yeah, from um, Brian. Do, 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 do. Such a wonder. There we go. Um, there's quite a few, but that, that's just one I have handy. And it's for looking at training a machine learning model uh, just with Amazon SageMaker. A lot of the all use SageMaker, for, obviously, for the labs, but some will focus on uh, just the data part, or some will just focus on the data parts done. Let's get the machine learning deployed and, and use as a prediction. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a, it's such an interesting space, and I think it's really um, rewarding. Oh, um, possibly a Pearl site subscription, maybe. Um, I'll uh, I'll try and find out more about that as well. But um, I've just signed in um, into my own account, so. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, uh, Brian, I think that is. Yeah, you can um, you can reach out to me as well if you've got the subscription, but something's a bit funny. You can see uh, what I have on my end as well. Darren, I have a question about uh, Deep Racer. Sure. Sure. So, um, is Deep Racer something that you had mentioned that was competitive? Is it? Be is it? competing against other companies or is it just really the community as such both actually um oh, cool the it's heavily against other people but a lot of these other people have uh joined together kind of like as a company yeah but there's also wildcard tickets that were offered to different companies so in some form you're going to race against them as well if you make it to the the grand finals and um, yes for liberty it was definitely a mix of your you're fighting like the chance to get a ticket, but also um, to represent the company that is, is going to uh, play against a, another company. Yes. Um, yeah, it kind of mixes. That's a good question because the, a lot of developers that are racing will identify the company they work for. Um, ah, cool. And a lot of them are uh, really into like the ML space or, oh, like myself, a lot of the kind of starting routes to that kind of competition yes no that's cool no i i always seen there was like football leagues for i suppose uh other people uh, you know amongst companies but this i suppose accommodates uh people like us <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh, uh it is addictive if yeah. you start to if you start to get the the lot times that you want to see as well um but yeah, like it is all recorded as well. So it's um, hopefully any links I've shown that can be just paused on to you if needed uh, for any of the guys. Great, thanks. Yeah, and if anyone has um, any issues with the links or anything, you can drop us uh, an email at community at nigma.co.uk and we can find that out for you. Cool. And th thank you guys as well for organizing all this. Um, it's super smooth. I couldn't, I couldn't have went better, I think. Oh, thanks so much for giving up your time. Um, I, I think it went pretty well too from what people are saying <laughs> in the chat. So I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, I suppose uh, the only other thing to mention is there's a poll and some links to do with the Enigma community if you're wanting to follow us for future events. 
But um, if, if anyone has any additional questions, I'm happy enough to hang on for a few minutes. But if not, we, we could end the session. All right, well, that, that seems like um, that, that will do us for this evening. Uh, thanks so much, Darren. That talk was super interesting. I think personally, I'm going to look into more about the AWS Deep Racer and sort of that um, voluntary scheme you were talking about too. I haven't heard of it before. Oh, the Builders Program. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's really good, yeah. Yeah, so um, I find that very interesting. Yeah, so, I also have released a, a medium article as well, just to kind of explain what's kind of what the sites are there, but just uh, some tips for applying to. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks so much. No problem. Well, thanks everyone for coming, and um, I hope everyone has a lovely evening. I know um, we've run on a wee bit, but thanks for sticking around and. Happy Wednesday. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your week. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.